Thank you very much for joining us. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dave Corbin from Gleeds. And it's been an absolute honour to have Dave come in from time to time to give his his insights and to give up his time, really, just so that he can impart what's going on in the world of project management. But I think what's even more kind of fantastic is having opportunities or resources or colleagues and friends such as Dave, who have got a wealth of experience and brings that into uh, an environment on this platform that everybody can can benefit from. So I'm really genuinely thankful for, for Dave for, you, for your time and very, very appreciative of that. But before I obviously continue any further, let me say thank you ever so much. And I'll hand over to, to Dave, who will take this session forward. And as we go through, myself, Vasilis and Fred will just jump in with any questions throughout the, the session. I'll talk a little bit about the APM first, the Association for Project Management, uh, uh, and then we'll look at pro project leadership. I'll, I'll touch on it as a as a role, as a defined role, but more more I'll spend more time looking at uh, as leadership as part of being a project manager, and um, they do go hand in hand. So it's uh, and it could be the difference between being a project manager and a really really good project manager so hopefully hopefully you'll, you'll get a feel for that as we go through and a few um, specific elements about style and adapting and working with others um, uh, before wrapping up with some um, some of the the observations that I've kind of particularly picked out through through my career uh, that might help you uh, as you embark upon yours so first of all um, who am I I, I love I love putting this photo on the screen mainly because um, a it shows I'm a Man United fan before they started winning everything and definitely before they started not winning everything. Um, but really, I just love putting this up the screen of my big brother in a pair of hot pants and a geeky T-shirt. And he has no idea I, I do this. And it just gives me a sense of great satisfaction every time I get the chance to do so. So, uh, so yeah, that's my big brother Matt. He was, um, as I say, the T-shirt says it all. Really, he he was one of these guys. Flew through school. He got his. Um, he went, did his A levels straight after. Went and did a year in Honduras. You know, teaching uh, poor poor children in Central America English. He then went to um, a Red Brick University. Uh, got a great job. Uh, you know, is is. You know, highly successful, earn loads of money. You know, he's just ho horrible in all senses of the word, as far as I'm concerned. So you can imagine uh, little old me didn't really go to school. Well, I went to school to not go to school. Didn't really enjoy my my GCSEs. Ended up uh, going out its work uh, as a 16 year old and finding my way to university a, a little bit later. So you can imagine my joy when I compare my first class honours degree to his mere 2-1 uh, that he achieved uh, as a highly academic brother. Um, the reason I say that uh, and, I, and I share that with you is that uh, I think project management is probably the career uh, that I, I see most that doesn't have anywhere near a straight line path. You don't have to come from a certain background. You don't have to go through a certain academic route. You don't have to um, do it as a, as a first career. People come into project management through a whole different route of ways. As I say, I I started my first full-time job as a, an apprentice gas engineer for British Gas on my 16th birthday and found my way working through different courses with building services, um, found myself as a chartered engineer uh, designing services within building. And I found myself um, realising that actually, whilst I was OK at engineering, um, I didn't really have my heart in it. I liked being in the, the, the heart of the project. So I liked being in the middle. So I moved. I convinced my company at that point that they should back me to start a project management offering in Southampton. Um, and from there, I, I then um, moved through the ranks of that particular company to a point where I was heading up their project management department. Uh, and uh, after 20 years of, of working with a company called WIG, uh, in late 2019, I decided that it was time for a change and joined Gleeds who, um, uh, for a similar role. So I I lead their program and project management capability in the UK. We have about 190 project managers um, delivering projects in the built environment. So whether it's um, buildings or infrastructure uh, and um, in a rather 
uh, I don't really quite understand how, but I, I as of this year, it's 30 years in industry um, that um, that I have um, uh, to to my um, to to my 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 name, uh, which just makes me sound like a dinosaur, and it and it kills me to say it. So um, so yes, yeah, so that, that's that's me, and uh, and and so if I just share a couple of my my own personal projects that that that. Uh, relate to today's session um uh you know i thought it might help so probably the most difficult project i've been asked to to help out with uh, in my career um i got involved halfway through when it was in a really difficult spot where the client was faced with possibly spending 11 million pounds to turn it back into a playing field and the first activity that i had on in my involvement was to serve a termination notice to the whole team that gave them 20 days to sign up to new ways of working or to be um, removed from the job. And the reason um, that's not a, a sort of standard typical approach to, to um, mobilizing a new team and forming this new collaborative environment, but it was a necessary step in that project that meant it could move forward. And, and the reason I share it is that dealing with confrontation is a key part of being a good project manager. And sometimes you have to take those brave steps and 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 be have a tough line in order to get the best outcome for the project. And knowing when to do that is really important. My favourite project from a from a working point of view is is this um, yeah reasonably small school in West Sussex. It's Bolner Village Primary School. I think it's the first school that was built as a community led um, uh, or parent led group under the new kind of competition rules for schools. Um, and it was a, a great development. The reason I really like it, it was an impossible timeline. It just wasn't possible to deliver it on, on, on paper. Um, the client had already committed to a number of pupils joining in the following September. And unless we achieve the, the end product, they wouldn't have a school to go to. So the team got together very early on and, and really formed a tight collaborative bond that that, that agreed that we were going to find a way to deliver this project. And by applying a different strategy to the normal kind of way of building things, we were able to sort of twin track to you know, activities that historically would have meant that it wasn't possible. And we achieved it. It was in budget. It was a great product. It was um, a great sustainability exemplar. But the bit I really like about it is the way the team formed that initial kind of agreement to, to overcome the challenges and deliver it. And to this day, everyone still talks about this project being one of the most enjoyable that they worked on. And then the last project I'm going to share with you wasn't that enjoyable at all. It wasn't actually that. Uh, it was interesting. It was a complex refurbishment of a Canadian embassy. But I'm really just doing it to name drop Queen because she came and opened it for us. And like all good projects, um, her arrival in, in the February of that year was immovable and we had to have it finished. Uh, and so so um, like all good project teams, we made it look like it was finished. We allowed the Queen and Prince Philip to enter the building and shake hands. And then as soon as they were ushered out the building, we all got back to work to really finish it. So um, so again, you know, it was a, a great example of how a very complicated project was um, under very strict timelines and you had to pull together to make it work uh, to everyone's advantage. So that's a little bit about me. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to now share a little bit about the APM, the Association for Project Management. It's um, they, they do um, some great research work. In fact, um, uh, you guys know more about that than than I do, having um, you know undertaken the the recent research, uh, which uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the out, outcomes off very very soon. But part of their one of their research documents was called the Golden Thread, um, and in the Golden Thread it looked at the um, the importance of project management to to industry, and you'll see on the screen that um, they they found that that about 1.56 billion um, pounds uh, of UK GDP was attached to project management. It's a major player in industry, it's everywhere. Um, and, and I think that's one of the beauties of project management is that it doesn't have to be in buildings or infrastructure. It's not HS2 or, uh, I mean, it is, uh, or, or the, the Olympic games. It's everywhere. If, you, if, you, if you're in Formula One, 
uh, there, there are project managers. If you're in a charity sector, there are project managers. If you're in you know, the, the more traditional ones like IT, there are project managers. Yes, Nick? And I think the golden thread one is just fantastic. And it's actually a piece of research we've used um, quite extensively in terms of uh, bringing this to light. Because I think it, sometimes it surprises people. I, I think that's the key, the, for me anyway, that's the key finding from the golden thread. I think it genuinely surprises people that it is so, um, that it permeates so, so many different fields, that in many ways it's so ubiquitous, and also that it generates or is responsible for such a large amount of UK GVA as well. Yeah, so 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 um, when we, um, so a bit later on, I'm going to talk about sort of future skills in the workplace, and, and, and hopefully you'll see how um, project management and project leadership skills are very much aligned with the future skills required in the workplace, not just in the project management world um and, and so it really is really is um you know a, a good uh, a good career to embark upon and uh, and, uh, and and because it's everywhere you can actually generally do it in somewhere that uh, a sector that you like as well you don't you know so so for me that's a that's a win-win so the APM is is uh, the Association for Project Management. It's a chartered bo uh, body, which means that you you can get that that um, uh, accredited status through uh, membership and application, um, and it's a it's a, it's a great environment for um, knowledge sharing and networking within the industry. So um, I think we've got about thirty thousand members, predominantly in the UK, but growing overseas, and but definitely respected all over the world. Uh, the way it's structured is that you have um, a range of branches across the UK uh, and then a number of special interest groups. So uh, the branches are on your screen at the moment. You guys in Southampton are in the Wessex branch by geography. But you, you don't have to just follow or be a member of a particular branch. You can you can follow as many as you like. So for those of you that might just be studying in um, in Southampton, but you know, live elsewhere in the UK, there's absolutely no reason why you can't attach yourself to multiple branches and, and get a feel for what's going on in your region. At the same time, you can follow as many or as few uh, SIGs as you would like. So uh, if you've got a particular interest in a particular area, these are really great knowledge hubs for, you know, new pieces of work, you know, expert thinking in those areas. I was just having a chat earlier on today with the chair of the uh, the knowledge sig and talking about knowledge management and knowledge sharing and 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 so the, the level of expertise that sits within these SIGs is is incredible so again if you're particularly interested in any any area of of, of um, the project management community then these are great uh, resource tool and networking tool um one of the benefits at the moment, we're not. There's no face-to-face -face activities going on, certainly until the middle of this year. So the APM were very quick to roll out a series of free webinars, which are available to all all people, member or not. So, um, so on the left-hand side of the screen here, you'll see the, the, the front page of the the webinar list. It's um, uh, if I sh if you share the, the the screen after, there's there's a, a web link attached to it, but it's just on the APM site and under under events and and they come up and you'll see the frequency of, of events all and and covering all sorts of different ranges um you you may wish to uh, get on the uh the fellow uh module that's coming up uh soon nicholas although it might be too late um and on the right hand side something which i hope will be of interest to you guys is the branch awards and um, these branch awards started off as being individual branch awards, but now they feed into a, um, a UK final. So the deadline is looming for the Student of the Year award. It's quite an easy, it's not, not a massive amount of work to enter. The deadline's 26th of March. Um, that will go into a Wessex branch uh, competition and the winner of the Wessex branch then gets pitted against the winners of all the other regions uh, to become uh, the, uh, you know, the, the recognised uh, UK winner. Um, sadly, our Wessex branch um, uh, uh, winner last year didn't, didn't bring home the bacon for the UK award. Uh, so looking for that next Wessex uh, flag bearer and maybe they're uh, listening to, to this call if they do see it before the 26th of March. Uh, but maybe you can share it with them uh, in any event, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. It will be my pleasure to do so.
Yeah, great. And then, as I said, they also publish lots of um, uh, research uh, tools and information which are freely available to um, members. Um, and, uh, you know, um, you guys will be uh, particularly uh, keen, I, I guess, to promote at some point the, um, the, uh, the, the, the work you're doing at the moment, which builds on the conditions for project success, which is the one on the furthest left hand side. So good networking, good research, good knowledge. Um, uh, you know, why wouldn't you join, uh, especially to all those students where it's free? Um, so you, you, you go on the website, you chuck in your details, uh, it doesn't cost you anything, and then you have access to, to, to all this information. Um, obviously, then there's a career path in um, following through your membership onto associate, full member, and indeed fellow um, uh, at some point. So there was a quick canter on on the APM, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll all go away and join and um, and get the benefits of that. I, th I think the APM is really good also in providing support for possibly uh, for master students in terms of dissertations. So this is one of the things I've highlighted to to the team. I've said, you know, um, have a look at some of the uh, dissertation support that's out there in terms of getting surveys out and respondents and. Um, overall, I found, in that respect, I found the APM to be an incredibly good uh, body that is able to support our students and has does have our students at the, the forefront of their mind. Um, and there are a number of members, obviously, such as um, who, who are in the APM, a number of uh, staff or employees uh, of uh, the APM, who are also really supportive in trying to um, organise SIG members to come out and do um, guest lectures and things like that as well. So. I, I, I mean, Vasilis and Fred, I, I think you guys have got a similar experience in terms of your relationship to to the APM. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I agree. Um, when when I uh, at any time when I've been in contact with the APM, it's always uh, some kind of response that helps you either with a direct question or helps you further on uh, in your search of what you're looking for. So, yeah, the APM is a great resource that I think uh, the students should definitely look into if you haven't done that already. Yeah, and I supervised a lot of master's students last year. So if the APM can help them, you know, get some data, this is uh, usually the biggest challenge with master's dissertations. It's really difficult for a student to get into like a large company and ask, you know, mm -hmm. any questions really. Um, so if the a APM can provide like that bridge, um, that's definitely really, really useful. Yeah, so one of the new features of APM membership is access to the APM hub and um, it's effectively a closed membership or a members only. Uh, it's going to sound really cheap. Uh, it, it's like a social media um, platform for project managers. And um, so if you're a student uh, member, which uh, you know doesn't doesn't cost you anything but five, five seconds to type your details in, you get access to the hub. And, and in the hub, there's lots of people that are dedicating their time to supporting other project professionals. So especially those who are embarking on their dissertations, if they need to get some some uh, uh, survey uh, inputs or some knowledge from from existing practitioners, you know, that that is a place which is made up of people who are willing to put extra time in to support others in the industry. So it's a definite it's a. a, a uh, I hadn't thought about it before today, but there would be real value in your students um, uh, going to that hub for that uh, industry input. So uh, project leadership. Uh, so first of all, um, the, the, the image I just had was a front page off a, a, an APM, uh, a piece of APM research. Um, and, and that talks about project leadership as a defined role. So all projects need a project leader. Um, the role, which is described in, in the research document, talks about, um, I just need to make you guys a bit smaller, two secs. Um, yeah, the, the, the role talks about the project leader and um, providing strategic uh, direction and strategic intent, um, whereas they talk about the project manager planning, measuring and controlling. So very much kind of tactical delivery. Um, where the project leadership role is is an elevated place which is looking at emerging issues uh, and what is required to align everything together in, into to delivery. Um, 
when they talk about who that leader might be, they talk about them being visionary, uh, diplomatic. They talk about being politically savvy, um, you know, being able to, to lead by establishing transparency, being decision makers. Um, you know, it's quite it's quite a, a big must have list. And I personally can't remember having too many project leaders in posts that meet all of that criteria. So actually, as a project manager, what you find yourself doing is providing your project leader with that type of ability um, or information to make decisions or to be able to guide the future vision. So the project manager becomes the aid of the project leader. When they talk about the the survival skills uh, that are required for that role, again, there's nothing tactical in there. It's all leadership, um, good leadership stuff. It's it's the obvious stuff. But it, it but it it differentiates again the sort of that piece about the project manager being there to deliver um, uh, the process in order to achieve a goal, whereas actually the project leaders there to anticipate and judge and to, to look over the horizon and see what's coming um, coming ahead. So, um, so, so when when you look at those um, uh, when you look at the the leadership elements, it's quite often dovetails in with being a project manager or being involved in a project. But I think it's important to recognise maybe when you're in leadership mode and when you're in project management mode and often you're doing them at the same time but still still important to recognize them in the apm body of knowledge they talk about so th this is now starting to talk about leadership generally again as you would expect it talks about vision direction and and the ability to influence it talks about um communication of vision and values and objectives so again it talks uh, it's talking about leadership as a as a whole the, the major projects association has a, uh, a project initiation handbook and it's got 10 tenets of, may, uh, of, of, of projects which um, they think leads to successful delivery. And the reason I show this now is that, that you know, if you just look at those 10 tenets, at least three of them, at least three of them have leadership and people management at the core of that. It's, it's such an important part of um, driving forward projects. Um, to successful conclusion. So if we look at it then from a project manager's viewpoint, uh, and this is where where you know, the, the most of this, this session will focus, um, it talks about leadership not being something you can assume. Uh, we, we, it, leadership is something that needs to be granted by followers. So you hear now more and more reference to followership uh, as well as leadership. Um, it also, in the body of knowledge, talks about how you need to adapt your style to 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 um, get the best out of the team and get the work done. And what I really like in the most recent body of knowledge that the APM have published is it's starting to bring in words like social impact and ethical aspects to, to the description. It's not acceptable anymore in society just to deliver um, something within budget and within cost. It, it now has to be delivered responsibly and and aligned with current pressures and priorities that exist in 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 across the globe. So so I think how you know like like everything it's starting to evolve. Uh, the the leadership piece is starting to evolve into something that's more than just um, getting from from A to B. So when when you look up the differences, um, uh, and there was a podcast which which I, I um, have taken this from, um, you know they 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 start listing out some of the, um, the the differences, and they talk about the project manager directing the work and the project leader leading the people. So the manager schedules and, and the leader guides towards vision. Uh, the manager reports and the leader plans. And so on and so forth. Um, in my mind, there are there are more than one of those kind of lines that that I think are just as applicable to uh, project managers as they are project leaders. For example, you know, I expect a project leader to develop others, um, and I expect project managers to 
um, to inspire others. Uh, oh, sorry, I've just uh, lost my notes for a second, two sets. Um, and and so so actually, um, you know, again, it just proves that point that you're probably leading and managing at the same time, and you you're probably responsible as a project manager for controlling the work, but you're probably also responsible for motivating and directing the team. So um, knowing knowing where you are um, at any given point um, will be really helpful for you to, to make sure you're getting the best out of what, what you're trying to achieve. When, when you look at those top skills for um, project managers, again, you know, we're talking about the leadership elements of it. We're, we're, we're talking about communication, team leadership, conflict resolution. I talked about that when, when I looked at the, the school project earlier on, motivating the team, crafting solutions. You know, I talked about Bolner Village Primary School and um, you know, the, the great sense of satisfaction, the real value that we created there was crafting the solution, not not the, the you know um, driving a risk register or, or pulling together the schedule, although they were key to um, being able to deliver it. And just hold hold those in in your mind when you're when you're talking when we're talking later about the 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 skills required or anticipated to be required in in, uh, in the future in the general workplace. So if I was in a workshop group now, I, I'd be sending you all off on breakout groups to reflect on you know where where you have seen good and bad leadership and to think about the impact of that and as you as is the norm quite often people come back and they'll talk about the bad leadership and and the demotivational element that or feeling that came with that the feeling of being micromanaged the the well, you know, yes yeah, sorry Nick. i was just thinking should we, should we just do that now let's um, it seems like a quite a, a good exercise let me share some insights then into, and then i want to I'll, I'll let fred jump in as well so i in response to the question so think about an example of both good and bad leadership now what i, I don't want to do is i uh, I don't want, I'm not going to name names and say this individual was a bad leader. For, for the, but what I can do is I can talk about traits that I have seen in the project profession. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I find the most infuriating and frustrating in terms of bad leadership traits is when a leader is disorganized. Now, however, because I think I think the, the, the challenge with disorganized leaders is it leaves the team in disarray. It makes it a little bit challenging for, for communication and getting a hold of that person. But what, and, and again, actually, Dave, I'll be really interested to see, to see what your thoughts are about this. So from a project team perspective, if I'm the one who's experiencing that the leader, I see them as being disorganized because I can't get hold of them. There's no clear direction. There's the... But what I've what I've experienced on the other side, as I've gone into the project leadership side of things and no longer in the project team, I've actually found that one of the dangers and one of the bad traits about being a bad leader or bad leadership is over committing yourself. And sometimes you can fall um, victim of over committing yourself, is promising too much to too many people and saying, yes, I, I'm really interested in this project. Let me help out here. I'm really interested in this project. I'm, I want to help out here. And in effect, you are just one resource that can only give your time and strategic leadership. And I think, so let me finish with this point. One of the teams that we are working with, uh, in, in fact, Vasilis and I are working with, with this team, and I think there's a a co leadership or a very flat hierarchy, <clears throat> a very flat hierarchy. In what happens in that situation, in terms of good leadership traits, I think it's all about complementing each other. Like it's, it's, so, my colleague might be quite busy, then I'm able to just jump in and, and provide the leadership that's required. I might suddenly be busy for whatever reason because I'm overcommitted in another region. Then he's able to jump in and say, OK, well, this is how we're going to go, go. And I I find that really a good trait of, of good team management leadership. Mm -hmm. And it brings me back to an earlier. So this was back in the 1970s um, when Dave, when you and I were in our 30s back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this brings me back into the 1970s. So there used to be um, in the cockpit in in, in aeroplanes. Basically, the, the 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 captain was was God. Whatever the captain said, 
it, the cat, you know, the co-pilots, nobody else could argue. Whatever the captain's decision was, that was it. And what they found out over years and years is that actually this was the wrong approach to take to say, you know, that the captain is the most senior person, they're in charge because human error, bad decisions led to a number of fatalities, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, there are some very famous uh, examples of this where people unfortunately have lost their lives as a result of, of bad decisions. So what they they came up with was a much more kind of flat, collaborative cockpit uh, management system or co cockpit hierarchy system where, you, you know, a co-pilot is in a position to say, well, hold on a minute, maybe that's just not the right way of doing that. And I think that led, that, that change in mindset led to better leadership traits, but also better leadership outcomes for the team. So, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, so it's really kind of like that, that idea of over committing yourself but then maybe you need you need good team members to rely on and i think the takeaway line is leadership isn't just about one person for me leadership is about a team of 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 people and it doesn't matter whether you're the project champion whether you're the project manager for me leadership is a team consensus a collaborative approach what, what yeah, do you guys think yeah, so 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 I think I mean what you talk about there are are, are transitions from different styles of leadership and and um, you know so so um, you know in the current in the current era you know you you, you need your team to succeed and um, and that that in itself is part of, of leadership creating the environment where the team can contribute and and be part of the solution you know you. you you can't lead yourself. You, you you need to you need someone to to lead, and that team needs to be feeling motivated and empowered to to deliver things. It's interesting what you say about the um the the the, the supporting and the overcommitting. I think there's two things that struck me in that. One is that you've got to remember that you um that you have to deliver. You, you know, lead, a, a big part of leadership is based on trust and credibility and and respect. So if you if you continually fail to deliver on your promises, then you will lose trust, respect and credibility. And therefore, you, you won't be allowed to lead. You, you might have a position of leadership, but you won't be able to lead. Um, so some actually being you know true to your word and, and doing what you said you would do is is really, really important. And recognising that and not taking on too much um, yourself is is key. A lot of people move into leadership positions because they've been good at something else, not because they were trained to be a leader. So their natural inclination is to get stuck in because that's what they enjoyed doing in the first place. Uh, and so I, I talk uh, towards the end about um, being a helicopter. And actually, when I did a bit of kind of prep, prep work for this session, I, I thought I'd just see what the current take on helicopter management is. And I thought, whoa, whoa, that's not the message I want to give. I don't want, you know, they talk about micromanaging, about the team feeling like they're, um, they can't move, that it's generally aligned to bad behaviour. And, and I thought, blimey, I can't, I can't share that with you guys anymore. But actually, the bit I wanted to get across is that as a leader, and this comes to your point, Nick, you need to recognise when you need to come down, when you need to land, you know, come off your, you know, the point is you're up in the air, you've got vis um, visibility of a much broader uh, and far ranging horizon. But you need to recognise when you, you you come down and you land for, for a while, you get in the muck and bullets of things, you help your team, you roll your sleeves up and you get stuck in. Most people at that point tend to stay there. And that's when you start getting in on people in people's way you're no longer helping you're no longer part of the solution you've got to get back up and and the leadership element of it is that you come down and help but you get out of there once once you've done that bit and you let them you let it get back to business as usual you let them have their ownership their their um their free reign and and you know that that to me is part of the art of that 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 um understanding when you're required and more importantly, when you're not required. Um, so if that if that's not helicopter leadership, maybe one way of looking at it or thinking about it could be bungee jump leadership, 
where you you're you're you know as time goes by you're 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 stepping further and further away from the team because you're giving them more autonomy or you're giving the project more autonomy and you become more aware of 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 their their ability to fulfill that but i mean vasilis you you've dealt you, as a leader you've you've managed international conferences you've really done some some you know some quite some interesting things what have you what have you experienced in term, within that context as bad leadership traits and good leadership traits that you could share I already talked about bad leadership traits, I guess. Sure, but, I mean, that's very broad. That, that was a very broad one. I, it's something that, you know, more no, more, more closer to I your think, heart. I, or... But I think kind of saying the opposite of the bad leader is, is a way to go into the good leadership traits, you know. So, for example, someone that cares about others and listens to their needs, you know, and kind of cares to see them do well, you know. In, in the project, for example, and support rather than, you know, criticize in a bad way. Um, but I think uh, for me, the, the most important good, good trait of a leader in a project is, you know, being proactive and kind of at the beginning or throughout the whole project saying, yeah, these are the things that can go wrong, risk management kind of thing. And then these are the things that can go great. And where is the reality in between? And how can we steer the project towards, you know, doing well rather than uh, not doing well, you know? And uh, for me, like, again, because like I've organized events, blah, 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 being proactive is number one, you know, starting early and saying, OK, what do we have to do? These are the things we need to do. How much time do we need for these things? And again, I'm not like I don't get into technicalities like I don't do a lot of WBS and planning on Excel spreads and stuff. It's a simple brainstorming session where, you know, you can spend some minutes just saying, yeah, these are the 20 things we need to do. And this is kind of how much time we need for each one. How much time do we have? You know, so, and, so, and, 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 and you'd, be, you'd be surprised how people don't do that. That's the thing. So, <laughs> so, so what's interesting about that, Elias, and, and um, especially right now where where we're all working kind of remotely is that um you know someone will listen to what you've just said and will will, will be nodding their head and, and resonating and someone else will be shaking their heads going blimey I, I'd hate that and and that's that's part of the, the challenge we have so so I delivered a, a similar session to our our graduates in in Gleeds and uh, there were two two cohorts and on the first cohort an example that came up was that um that they were continually peppered by Teams calls, checking in and seeing how they're getting on. And the, and, and the guy who raised it was saying, I just want to be left alone to get on with my work. So he was higher autonomy, was distracted by these Teams calls and uh, felt that they were, were a hindrance. On the, next, the very next session, um, a colleague said that, um, that she felt that she had been given work to do and then no one really kind of supported her or checked in with her to see um, to see how she was getting on. And she she needed that that kind of comfort blanket. She needed that bit of support. And um, and it's exactly the same scenario, just cast from two different um, personality types. And, and and so so again, uh, you know, so when you look at, well, what could you have done to improve that situation? What for, for one person, the improvement would have been. Um, a negative for the other uh, and so then it comes back to this bit of go right well I recognize that we need to 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 check in and see how things are going some people may like it or may not so why why not put in a structure that is predefined so it's not personal and then if it only takes five minutes then it doesn't matter but at least it's part of the process rather than feeling like they're just calling in because they don't trust what I'm doing and and so there's little things that you can do that put a common structure in place that deals with both, but doesn't look like you know the the, the enemy to to one individual. I think um, it's I, th I think that's a great example. I think it's about finding the right balance. So, I, so myself, Fred, and Vasilis are working on a a, a a module together, and at the beginning, so this typically will run for twelve weeks. And I was quite happy to say, here's here's the stuff. See you in twelve weeks' time. You know, yeah. you see 12 weeks, guys. I know you can do it. See you 12 weeks. So, you know, it's all good. And then Vas was like, well, in his previous institution, he, he worked with a colleague of his and he said to me, I really enjoyed the weekly meetings that we had. So I was I learned from that. So, well, you know, that's maybe that's a good way of doing it. Let's do that. And then we we ended up having, you know, these well, we are having these these weekly meetings and it's really good in terms of 
been able to to catch up. So I think it's just fi- finding that 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 right balance. But you, Fred, I mean, what's what do you think in terms of? So I don't know how much experience you've had as a leader, but what do you think? Um, and I know you've had plenty of experience in terms of being the victim of bad leadership, of course. Well, well, actually, actually, that's probably more interesting to to the people listening today because uh, they'll 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 be thinking about well, you know, I, I'm asking them to think about the leadership that they've they've experienced, not not as a leader. So I'll, yeah. I'll be really interested to hear your example, Fred. Well, if I if I it wasn't that long since I was an undergraduate master student, well, it hasn't been that many years since, but. Uh, yeah, and back back in those uh, days, you, as a student, you often, sometimes at least in some modules, you come across group work that you need to do. And I mean, the 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 best group works are usually when you work with a person that you know the strengths and weaknesses in. But then usually you come with a team with some people you might not know. And and luckily in the module uh, we we lead here, we have a an, an individual assignment, so that's not an issue. But I think in those situations, the, the students listening to this can really relate when they have had a poor teamwork, and that usually leads, in my experience, is that one person didn't take on the role as assigning work and didn't take the role as communicating within the group, because if that is not taken on or at least uh, delegated, it usually doesn't <laughs> lead to a good work, at least not a good experience. You don't know what the grade will be in the end. You might get an A, but the experience is usually quite painful to get there. And um, so I think that's something that maybe the students can learn. If, if you guys, if the students listening to this have a group work uh, coming up, you can, you can take that experience and maybe take that leader role in that group work. And you will hopefully see a, a great improvement in, in that uh, whole group work and um, so that that's my experience in bad and how it's quite easy to to make it imp- to improve a, a group work in a project leadership but also more closer to myself uh, is uh, within sport team sports and I played a lot of football back in the days and uh, you can really see how when a team is performing good you have the manager that is really really um, you have a lot of trust with the manager and they, you have the captain delegating, but also you need to trust each player on the field. Like you guys mentioned previously, you, you have you complement each other. And uh, I think that works in many different uh, and ex- environments as well. If, if you play in a, in a band, music band, or if you're playing online gaming, for example, you, you have to complement each other and take on a leadership role, maybe for a short time just to... Yeah just to take on that uh, specific uh, skill that you have. So I think there's a lot of times um, in your free time that you can improve project leadership and, and actually see some some improvements, actually. Yeah, and to, using that that football uh, analogy, you know, I think, I think every team can probably handle one um, precocious talent within their team that might change the game uh, through a moment of genius. But... You wouldn't you wouldn't want eleven of them on the pitch, would you? You you you, you need the people that are going to put the, the tackles in from from the, from the beginning through to the end, and and um, yeah, that is all about that teamwork and knowing what 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 works to get the best outcome. Um, so so that that ties in nicely with a, a bit I'm going to talk about in a minute ago, which is about styles and um, uh, you know, I've. There's an example I can I can give on um, on on absence of leadership actually where um, w- when you're in a in a group and and I was on a it was actually a leadership training course and we were somewhere in 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 the southwest peninsula for a few days doing all that that great stuff you know caving raft building all, all that jazz and um, I, on the second night I was having a bit of a chat with my HR business partner. And I said, do you know what? I'm really, really reflecting on the last two days. And I'm realising that my natural kind of energy is quite, quite boisterous and quite dominating. So um, tomorrow I'm going to take a back seat. I'm not going to ask lots of questions in the briefings. I'm not going to lead from the front in the exercises. I'm going to be led. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, and and she went, all right, let's see how you get on, Dave. I'll be interested to watch that. Uh, no chance, in other words. Anyway, next day came and it was a build a raft to get over to this this uh, island type stuff. 
and I just sat there and waited to be told what to do. And um, as we got near the end of the exercise, which we were clearly going to fail, everyone started really getting quite angry with each other. And that, uh, and and one of them pointed at me and said, "Well, what's happened to you?" I said, "Well, what do you mean? What's happened to me?" I said, "Well, they said you're you're normally at the front of this. You're normally driving us. We we need you. We needed you today, and you weren't there. What what's happening?" And and actually, it dawned on me that I'd done the worst thing possible because I I changed my approach to try and test out what it would look like, but I hadn't told anyone. So they they were assuming because they worked with me before. That we would all take our natural roles and and by me take you know voiding that it completely ruined the dynamics of the team and it, all i had to do is at the beginning of a session say guys for my own personal development i'm gonna i'm gonna be led here i'm not gonna sort of step in and it would have been completely different um so that little bit of communication would have made a world of difference um the the oh. second the, the, the second sorry nick yeah no 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 go go well i was just going to say on that first point i i could just see in the horizon if when 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 we do that people say what why what's wrong with you today why are you in such a bad mood why why are you not participating <laughs> and you're like yeah. no no i'm just trying to hand back some you know some some autonomy or agency and see how you guys get on oh dave's in a really bad mood today he's not really joining in <laughs> just, yeah uh, it's all on, it's all my fault apparently <laughs> yeah, that, that was me thinking, you know, uh, that, that my, you know, so I, so, so the, the, the worst thing is I come out of that thinking about how important I am, which was exactly the thing I was trying to to prove otherwise. Anyway, should, should we move on? Um, uh, so it's been great to, to chat through some of that stuff and maybe maybe the students listening can um, reflect on their own experiences and, and importantly think about, well, actually, what could that person have done differently that would have completely flipped the situation around to make it a better experience? And that might just then help you think about how you want to be as a leader in the future. So um, am I still, I'm not sharing at the moment, am I? So let me put that back on the screen. Um, there we go. Hopefully that's coming back back up for you guys. Um, okay, so so um, what's the impact of good leadership on a project? Well, work moves forward um, normally efficiently and quickly. Uh, it has clear direction, and normally because um, conflict resolution is not something that is avoided and is dealt with as part of good leadership. Um, you know, conflict and confrontation is also managed. Um, and resolved quickly. Um, you know, I've stressed it all the way through. The importance of good leadership in project management can't be overestimated. Um, it makes a, a, a positive difference to project success. And as I say, it's often a, t a case of blending skills and techniques in the right proportions at the right time. Um, so it's not a science, it is an art. It's the art part of good project management and that's the something that you'll gain through experience but also through knowledge of um of leadership type uh, uh styles and um and theories i did a I, I was i was delivering a session on enterprise leadership for uh for dstl which is a, a part of the mod and uh, i walked in the room and they'd been there all morning and they all had little stickers on their lapels uh, of a, a picture of an elephant a, a monkey a lion or a dolphin I was like well, what, what you're doing I'd never seen it before and it was a it's called the zoo personality quiz I think if you google it it's freely available to have a look at and um uh, and when I when I, when I looked it up I, I I struck by the the, the, the following sentence um with, with monkeys trying to joke with long-suffering elephants and impatient lions at odds with nurturing dolphins, the result is chaos. And I thought, yeah, yeah, of course it is. You know, you've got, you got different people just at, at loggerheads all the time rubbing up against each other and not really understanding what it is that the other person's frame of reference or, or natural kind of personality state comes from. And so um, in those exercises that you do, whether it's Myers-Briggs or whether it's Magnus and McCann or even the Zoo Personality Quiz, what you're doing by uh, undertaking those assessments is that you're finding out what your own dominant style is. You're finding out what 
what makes you tick and what your natural preferences are. There's different different ones out there that might focus on work and that nat, natural being. But in essence, they're telling you who you are. The actual most important thing is to know who your colleagues that you're working with are. So it's good that you know what, what you are. But if you understand what your colleagues' preferences are, you can then adapt your style temporarily to get the best outcome for the, the situation and the, and, the, and the project. So, um, so for example, I'm a I'm 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 an extrovert uh, and I'm um, I'm not I'm, I'm logic minded. So, you know, so I, I I assimilate information and I share it quite quickly because that's my personality type. When someone else they like to take time and they like to consider thoughts before sharing to make sure it's right and so for me that can be quite frustrating because I'm not getting the engagement I want in the time required for someone else they think oh here's Dave just bulldozing his way through through it again and and um and, and getting frustrated by that so it's important for me as a leader to recognize that and go okay I'm gonna I'm gonna just just adapt my style a little bit try and mirror what's going on over here get the best outcome uh, and, and that's not being disingenuous or trying to be someone I'm not. It's just adapting temporarily to get the best situation for that particular person. A, a real uh, a real moment in my career, a, a real reflection point. I used to have this um, guy called uh, uh, Pat. Uh, I won't share his full name. Uh, and he was um, he was he was a real details man. And I'm a bullet point person. Right? And he used to come up to me every day is one of my direct reports. And he would just reel off all this stuff to me and I got I just didn't have the time I wasn't that interested I knew that most of what he was telling me wasn't worth listening to it was really bad I mean I was so rude I mean I can't believe I'm sharing this with you I, I he would be talking to me he'd be briefing me and I'd carry on writing emails on my machine I'd listen out for key words and then every now and again I'd go oh, oh yeah, that's interesting tell me a bit more about that and he'd download a bit about that and when I'd heard enough I'd go back to my emails and let him carry on again and I, I kind of reflect on it one day. I said, what must this look like to Pat? I mean, I, I, he's trying to dispart all this really important information to his line manager. And he won't even like turn his back on his computer and listen. So I, so I just said to him one day, I said, you know, Pat, look, if you promise to come to me with bullet points, I promise I'll turn my back on my machine and listen to you 100%. And then we can delve into any parts that are of particular importance. And and just that one intervention transformed our relationship. He he transformed into sort of, you know, um, making sure the information that was important was prioritised and was brought to my attention. I gave him the time and respect he did, and I learned a lot from him. And I actually listened to him a lot more going forward and took in a lot more. Um, and it's just little things like that that make you realise that you go, you know, we were just completely poles apart. And all it took was that recognition and that moment to change the dynamics going forward. And, you know, uh, a great, great chap, loved, loved what he's about. He didn't need to change anything. Uh, it was just about reflecting how we communicate with each other. So, so again, if I was in um, the workshop style and, and you're welcome to, 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 to have a, another conversation on this, um, you know, I'd be inviting you to think about the different styles of your team members and and particularly someone that you enjoy working with and then what someone you don't enjoy working with in order to think about why that might be. What is it that makes someone you don't like working with and what is it that makes you enjoy? Because we all work with people. I mean, we get stuff done with, with different colleagues and, and different expertise and, and uh, experiences. And then, and then once you kind of do that, you then think about, well, what could you have done to have changed that experience that, that you, you had? So if you think about that person that you didn't enjoy working to, what could you have done as an individual to have flipped that relationship? So Fred, uh, you didn't get, uh, you didn't, we didn't come to you anywhere near as much in that last session. Have you got, have you got an, an example maybe of, of where you've, um, where you haven't enjoyed working with someone or where you have enjoyed and, and the difference in that? Well, well, before I, like you mentioned uh, your situation day, day before that you came into university a bit later, I, I did the same. I went into work straight after college and, and some of those positions were 
were really horrible, not only because of the manager. Um, I, I used to work within hospitality, for example, and uh, just uh, just some of the well, some shifts were amazing because you worked with some good people, some good colleagues, and you really you were just clicking and you had good chem good chemistry and those shifts were the best. But uh, if you were working with maybe a less pleasant person for some reason, could be you just you didn't collaborate good, perhaps, or you had some history that maybe something has happened in the past. Or if you your manager just uh, got switched out without any good preparation, um, it could definitely affect how you performed at work. And, and I remember some of those uh, times were not the best at all. But uh, overall, it was, a, it was a good learning experience, and I take that with me for for the future. But uh, and and what I've learned from those experiences are pretty much to be more upfront and to co co just communicate clearly. Um, and I wish I would have done that back then to see if that would have helped. But um, yeah. I, I do know that today that uh, take take control of the problem when it happens and don't let it escalate. Yeah, yeah. I, I think some I mean, it's interesting some environments are, are very difficult to work in. And you need to understand, you know, like catering, for example, is a particular one. If, you, if you've ever worked in a kitchen, then then you have to understand that the style that you're of uh, working arrangement is is um is different to if you're working in a um a, I don't know, a call center or, or somewhere um i i have had a recent example at my local rugby club where i um i i volunteer as a as a an age group manager and um i've kind of come through the the, the, the years with my 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 sons and um i couldn't work it out the the chairman uh um couldn't work it out. I couldn't work out why she didn't like me. She why she kept referring to me as a chocolate teapot, and um uh, and I was thinking, well, that's that's not. I, I volunteer. I put all these hours in. I'm trying to do the best I can, and you're generally just telling me I'm useless all the time. And I thought I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win her over. I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna sort this out. And I went on a bit of a charm offensive with with her, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And I couldn't work out. I thought I can't. What can I do here? I'm doing as nice as I can. I'm I'm being as as patient and tolerant. And I'm doing everything that she asks. And I'm, uh, why is she still not liking me? And then it dawned on me that she's been around that rugby club for about 35 years, dealing with rugby players day in day out who are far from being polite to her. And I just changed my style to being a bit more aggressive and being a bit more on the front foot and stop dancing around the. Uh, you know the, the issues and our relationship just turned in on a sixpence and it's it's amazing and it just she didn't trust me it just came down to trust she thought I was too too sort of slick too smart too kind of you know wasn't wasn't doing the right thing for a club thought I was all you know and actually um all she wanted was a bit of honesty and um and and uh, uh and an upfront thinking and that just made the world a difference and you think well you know so how does that work right and it's just the environment you're in, isn't it? It's just thinking about, well, what's that person's frame of reference? Where are they, you know, where have they come from? Uh, a chef, I was a dish pig in Australia for a little while, uh, a dish uh, washer. Um, uh, and uh, and I used to get berated by the head chef every day. And I, I said to him, yeah, so why are you such a, I can't remember what word I used. It wasn't a pleasant one. But why, why, why are you so horrible to me during these shifts? And of course, all he cared about was the quality of the food that went out at the right time to the customers. Because if it didn't do that, then his reputation suffered. And as soon as you realise that, then you can kind of go go with it. Um, so, so again, it comes back to you know that point about you know recognising why someone is acting the way they are, and working out what you can then do to 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 improve it. Yeah, without going back too much back into sports references, I mean. A lot of uh, temper gets uh, released on on the field in any any sports in any heated moment. But, but then again, the the goal is to score points, and if you don't do that, you're not achieving what you're supposed to. But then in the locker room after the match, after the game, you're all friends and uh, you can hang out again. So uh, it's similar in a project. If you don't, you might get heated if you don't deliver the the goals. But then it's nothing personal in the in the end. It's just yeah. for for the for the work purpose. So, so, so again, a really important point there that um, you know, good teamwork is not all about everyone being happy and jolly and and chummy. It's about achieving your goals. And you know, there is um, 
competitive tension, dynamic tension, what just tension that needs to exist between team members to sometimes get the best out of them. Um, so you're 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 absolutely right. You know you so so um, you know you you have to have your eyes on the prize, which is the, 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 what you're trying to achieve as a team. Uh, otherwise, you just you, you might all be very good friends at the end of it, but you wouldn't have actually achieved anything. So so knowing knowing yourself, but more importantly, knowing others is is incredibly important. Um, I thought I'd put this into into the mix because we're talking about project management and project leadership, and um, this is a, a a report that I've kind of followed for a while in terms of trends of what they anticipate being the top skills required for the workplace. Uh, so this last one was issued in uh, about October 2020, so it's quite recent, and it and it talks about what they think are the most important thing in the workplace. So this isn't project management or any particular area. This is just about general trends about um, what they think you might need in the next uh, four years time to be um, to, to most relevant. And um, actually, when you compare this report against 2020, um, in 2020, number one was complex problem solving. So you can see that slipped down to number three. Number two was coordinating with others. Uh, sorry, um, was uh, critical thinking, now number four, and number three was creativity, now number five. So um, analytical thinking, innovation and active learning, learning strategies are coming to the fore. And, and that's you know no real surprise when you think about technological advancements that, that we're, we're experienced with the, the, the fourth industrial revolution. And um, but actually what I find really interesting is if you go back to what they forecasted for 2015, Number one was problem solving, complex problem solving. Um, number two, though, was coordinating with others. And number three was people management. So you can see the trend that's moving away from managing people and what people do to actually embracing technology and um, and looking at new ways of um, delivering things. And they are becoming more and more important. But nonetheless, the problem solving and the the um, and the and, the, and the, the leadership piece still runs through um, through these skills. In my opinion, you know, at least seven of those top skills um, include project leadership skills. If you think about the list that I put up on the screen earlier of communication, team leadership, conflict resolution, motivation, and crafting solutions, they appear in in those seven at least. So, project leadership and project management. Um, exist now and and is going to be just as important in the future. It might, you know, the tactical delivery might change. So that bit about you know the project manager um, managing the risk register or change control that might start becoming more automated, and you might find more things are done um, through AI or machine learning or, or other technologies. But actually, the leadership piece piece is is not going away. Um, I also talked earlier about how um, ethics and social impact is starting to, to find its way into literature. And, um, you know, in that same report, it talks about the trends and moving more into a more fair and sustainable and equitable um, world. And for me, you know, as a project manager, you have the ability to influence the direction of travel on, on projects. You have the ability to, to talk to your client or your official project leader, whoever it may be, about what you are trying to deliver and influence them to deliver responsibly. There's a great little movement going on at the moment, which is um, quite, it stems um, from Bournemouth University, um, but it's but it's growing nicely, called Responsible um, PM. Um, I'll put the website on the screen. Um, and that's aligned with um, delivering projects uh, aligned with UN 70 sustainable development goals. And what I really like about it, is it, it talks about it, it's it's the concept of managing projects with conscious attention to the intended and unintended impacts of a project and its outcomes. So you you, you know so you're you're actually thinking about um, delivering projects now that deliver social environment and economic value without preference. And that's so different to where we've been in the past, which is all about sort of commercial, commercially led projects, getting a best bang for your buck. You know, 
individuals um, who won't work for companies that operate on those basis. You know, you only have to look at the workplace to see how that's evolving and the, the furore out there at the moment about well, what's a good workplace going to look like when when they come back. Companies aren't doing that because it, it, it adds to the bottom line. They're doing it because they recognise that people won't come join that company in the future unless they can, um, they're aligned with a more socially acceptable outcome. Um, so for me, it's a really key part, uh, key period for project managers and project leaders because we need to start influencing people and, and clients and organisations on their journey of developing responsibly. So, um, so some some tips that uh, that I've seen through my my career. So uh, I've talked a lot earlier about adapt, knowing your style and adapting to others. So the, the saying that I've used in the past is seek to understand before being understood. Don't expect your team to understand you. Make it your job to understand them and, and then get the best out of the, the, the situation. Um, learn from the team. Don't don't think that you have all the answers. Don't think that the people that, that, that should have all the answers are going to have all the answers. You know, try and encourage the team to operate in an environment where they're happy to contribute to ideas put put their their thoughts into the mix um i remember a, a, a job that was on the isle of wight which was a small school project and the architect just couldn't get his head around this kind of how he was going to design this wet area in a classroom and the glazing contractor happened to be waiting to to sort of um in the wings to to sort of help out and he kind of just piped up and went actually have you thought about doing it like this and, and sharing the space between two classrooms and suddenly they took the wall out of the, 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 the plan and had a shared area and it all worked. Uh, and you think, well, that shouldn't have come from a glazing contractor. That was that's an architectural thing. But nonetheless, that's where it came from. So try and learn from a team when you can. We talked earlier about good leadership and, and, um, and, and being based on trust and respect and, and credibility. So, you know, walk the talk. Don't don't don't. Um, don't set a, a vision and, and then not live by it yourself. Don't agree values and behaviours that you're going to operate with your team and then do something completely different because it just completely undermines your whole credibility in that role. So make sure that if you agree with a team how you operate, you you you, you operate in that fashion. You know, I've always made it my business in project team meetings and, and through the development of projects to ask how people are feeling. Uh, you know, in construction, as you can imagine, you know, this big boisterous world of uh, builders and and um, and people who have got to the top through being quite robust and, and maybe even bullies. You know, ask them how they feel is is quite alien sometimes. Fortunately, the industry has changed a lot since I first started. Um, but, you know, actually seeing how people feel about it may, you know, might, might actually lead you to do something different. You can sit through a meeting and you can agree some actions. But if everyone's leaving the meeting at the end and they don't believe it's the right answer or they don't buy into it, what are the chances of that getting done on time and done to a good standard? You know, limited at best. They might do it at a push. But, you know, if actually people are asked how they feel about it and they understand why you've done it and why that you're moving forward, then actually there's a good chance they'll buy into it as part of the, the team. I talked earlier about the helicopter, so I won't go back over that. You know, I left it in, but I made the point, get back up. That that's that's the trick. The other thing is 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 have confidence as a leader. You know, have, have confidence in the value that you you bring to the the party. Um, I talked earlier about delivering a similar session to this to my um, my grad course, and I was actually quite nervous because uh, I pushed in our business. We we came from a cost management background, so project management was seen as the poor cousin, and I pushed to get more project management modules included in that professional skills program. And it was the first time I was delivering uh, something that was not not um, that was new to their agenda, and I was really nervous about about how it would land. I, I needed it to land well because I made such a big song and play about need you know introducing these modules into the the, the mix, um, and I didn't mind sharing with a team that I was a little bit nervous about how it would land, but ultimately I had the confidence that that the content and as I am today will be valuable to those guys as I hope it will to your students at some point in their career. It might not seem like it right now and it might be a couple of years down the road, but I'm confident that the, the content of this will help in those situations. And it's important that I have that confidence because then that allows me to give that to the team. 
it allows me to share and and um uh, and hopefully the team will will see the value in it and then uh, have the confidence to then share it with others um there's nothing worse i think as in a project management or project leadership role it, it, when someone doesn't make a decision when they go away think about it and still don't make a decision um you know and you procrastinate and the team just kind of flounder and they don't they lose energy they lose motivation they lose direction so i i think you need to be brave you need to um, make decisions you need to offer that direction sometimes you might even get that decision wrong you go yeah we were talking earlier about my my son and his computer and just turning on the on button he decided that he was going to turn the on button on and if it went pop it went pop and, you know, it worked out for him in that case. It might not have always worked out, but he made the decision and 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 you can work with that. Sometimes you might not want to make the decision straight away and you need to take it away and consult, but make sure you go back and make that decision. We talked earlier about confronting issues. Um, I, I think as, as someone who is entering into their career at the early stages, this is the probably the bit they're most worried about how do you deal with confrontation especially if it's someone that might appear to be more senior than you or have more credibility than you um the art to it is to not be afraid of it and to 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 conquer conquer your fears and be brave and have that conversation nine times out of ten the issue is not as bad as you think it is is in, in your head um these issues don't generally go away. They, they don't disappear. You can't put it to the bottom of your inbox uh, and hope that they, you know, one day they'll magically disappear. They'll just fester and typically grow. So you've got to deal with confrontation in a professional way, in a way that allows you to come out with a, a, a an agreement um, and a way forward. Now, people, you know, people ask me, how do you do that? Uh, you know, the, the advice I give is is to prepare, prepare, prepare again. You know, think about what it what it is from their view. Why is it happening in the first place? Um, you know, and, and then as I say, have that little bit of bravery that that starts the conversation because that normally is the bit that that resolves it and stops it from growing. I had a I had a lot. I shared with someone uh, uh, that. You know, I had a lodger that I used to get so frustrated. I used to come down downstairs and that she she would have left breadcrumbs on on the work surface because she'd make a toast and go to work and didn't think two things about it. And every day I had to wipe those blimmin breadcrumbs off the surface. I mean, I'm not exactly Mr. Clean and Tidy, but it jo drove me mad. And it went on and on and on. And I can't work out to this day why I didn't just say straight away, "Can can you just wipe your breadcrumbs off the work surface?" Because the moment I said it. It was so so weird and pathetic, and she just went, yeah, all right, and and from then on, no more breadcrumbs, all right. But for some reason, I didn't feel like I wanted to raise it. I don't I don't know what it was. Uh, maybe I was trying to impress her. I don't I don't I don't know what it was. You know, but nonetheless, it was in my head. It was this issue that was a real non-issue. So be brave, um, address the confrontation. Again, aligns with um, walking the talk, you know, and that credibility piece. Um, we talked earlier about adapting your style. You know, if you adapt your style and, and you and you try to be someone you're not, you're not likely to have sincerity and authenticity. Um, and, and people people will reflect that. So it is important. I, I use the words temporary adapting, you know, adapting yourself temporarily earlier. And it's important to recognise who you are and be sincere about what you are doing and what you're trying to achieve. I also believe it's important to have humility that you know um, you know you share things that that enable people to get a relationship with you that's deeper than just the the, the project activity that you're trying to achieve. What that means for me is that when 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 people don't deliver as expected, I'm able to look them in the eye and go, "You've you've let us down there," and they feel a connection about, and they feel actually bad about not doing it. And, and the chances are they're not going to do that again because they don't want to feel bad. You're not you're not just an activity. You're you're a, you're a colleague. You're a, you're a trusted workmate. So quite often I'll share with people. I say the reason I need you to give this to me at twelve o'clock is because there's um there, there's Tom who needs to finish this by five. It'll take him three hours. If you don't deliver it until five o'clock, Tom's going to have to work until eight o'clock or midnight to finish it. And I don't want to ask Tom to do that. And so, straight away 
the chances of getting that, that bit of information at 12 o'clock is much higher than it was um, five minutes earlier. So have humility, have that sincerity, build the relationship, and then you can actually start asking people to do things and the chances are that they'll do it for you because they 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 don't want to let you down. And that that leads into the next bit, which is about aiming to be at the top of a pile of things to do. Nobody comes to work to fail. So when they're not delivering stuff on time or they're not doing the, the thing you asked for, you know, don't just get angry and, and feel resentful about it. Try and understand why it is that they're doing that. Why is it that they're not doing your bit of work in the time you agreed? You know, is there something that you can do to help with their workload if that's what's causing it? Is it because they don't believe in it and therefore they just don't want to do it? Is it a case that they can't do it and they just don't want to tell you and they're trying to put it off because they don't know how to deal with it because it's their confrontation that they don't know how to handle, right? So it's your job to understand, you know, why it's not getting done, but but actually try and make sure it is something they want to do. Um, and then and then uh, just two more. Uh, you know, don't be afraid about being a little bit different uh, and and bring in bring in something new to the table that might pique someone's interest. You know, again, you know, the world I live in, it's quite quite um, quite quite a well trodden path of construction. You know, you go through a process in a in a way. And I remember having um, a particular issue on a um, it was a school project where it was overheating in this courtyard. And I just needed a team to sort out this one situation. So I introduced a technique called FILE, um, which is uh, F-I-L-E, Fact, Ideas, Logic, Emotion. And it's just a, a, a kind of brainstorming process that stops you going into logic or whilst you're in the idea mode. It, it, you know, look, look it up. It's a great, great thing to, to have in your locker. Um, but, you know, you should have seen the faces on these guys who have been around the block for 20 years. And I went, right, guys, today we're going to do FILE. And they just looked at me with this face. Well, what are you on about, Dave? You, you know, it's ridiculous. We know what we got to do. We've just got to take down the roof and, you know, change it to a cover and, and stop all the solar and it'll be fine. So what we do, and sure enough, you go through this process and the outcome's completely different. Right? It's enjoyable. Um, you're able to have a bit of fun in, in doing it. And the outcome, the most important bit, was the right solution, having it, having quickly looked at all different sorts of things. So it wasn't just because that person said we should do that. It was a well-considered outcome done in a way that was different and people enjoyed it and participated so you get the best out of them. So don't, you know, you might feel like a bit nervous about doing it because you're putting yourself out there, but actually um, people will enjoy doing something a little bit different. And that comes to my last bit about introducing fun. Uh, you know, there's a... Um, you know, you, you need to introduce fun as the project leader and, and create an environment where people feel like they're able to have fun. It's unlikely that you as a project team member are going to feel confident to introduce fun in an environment that's not been permitted by your project leader. So for me, very early on, you need to you need to introduce that fun into the mix. You need to give people the freedom to to have fun and to introduce it themselves such that people enjoy working on your projects. And, and and that in itself can make a world of difference. I talked about Bolna Village earlier, the, the satisfaction we got. The teamwork on that was incredible because we, we just really enjoyed um, working in the environment that we set ourselves. We gave ourselves a challenge. We agreed how we would operate with each other. And we got so much out of it as a result. Um, whereas I can list off a projects as long as my arm where it was just a functional outcome. You know, we're paid to do that. We did it. We delivered it on to the next one yeah they're not the ones that i reflect on when i think about my career and i think about uh, what i enjoyed i pick out some really difficult projects but ones that have the right environment so um that kind of concludes um concludes where uh, the the project leadership bit um i'll take i'll take this off the screen now my contact details are there if anyone wants to reach out um happy happy to do so uh, so um fill your fill your boots if you if you contact me on linkedin let me know that you're from southampton university uh, otherwise i might not um might not connect i don't i don't generally connect with um people i don't know so but feel free to to reach out uh, should you want any help thank you ever so much thank you for everybody for obviously taking the time to, to join us today and thank you very much dave for, for giving us your time